very much for joining. Welcome to our webinar, Improving Profitability in Retail Hospitality. Three key lessons learned the hard way. Uh, I'm Ollie Brand. I'm the CEO here at Zupa, and I'm joined today by the one and only Chris Shelmerdine. Uh, so do you want to say hi, Chris? Yeah, good morning, Ollie. How are you today? You OK? Yeah, very well, thank you. Very well. Um, so we're really excited to share what we've prepared with you today. Uh, and, and let's get into introducing the, the kicking off the, the agenda and, and a little bit of housekeeping as well. Um, so the goal of this webinar is to empower hospitality entrepreneurs, entrepreneurs and entrepreneurs to break the mould and focus on realising their potential. And we believe that seeing and hearing real stories could push individuals to think differently, challenge their way of doing things and instigate change that could have an impact on the wider hospitality industry, regardless of what stage the business they are part of is in, or even if they're out starting on their own. And we're about to hear Chris's story, which would be fantastic. Um, we've prepared for approximately 25 minutes of presenting and 15 minutes of questions throughout. We want, to, we want this to be as interactive as possible. So please do send questions in as we go. And I'll aim to share the questions as close to the context as we can. And of course, I will be asking questions of Chris as well. So, um, just a very quick introduction to who we are at Zupa. So at Zupa, we exist to free people from mundane tasks to do what they love. And we do this through our catering management solution, Caternet. We believe hospitality businesses are always going to need to buy food, store it, make it into something amazing and sell it. And we look to find increasingly automated and intuitive methods of digitizing this. And we're fortunate to work with some great businesses and including Coffee House, which is a perfect time to hand over to Chris to introduce the coffee house. Yeah, thanks, Ollie. Yeah, we're, we're a, a chain of coffee shops up here in the northwest of England. I mean, we've been operating for 13 years next year, unbelievably. Uh, started the business uh, back in 2011 with Brother Steve, and we set out to change the way uh, people eat, drink and relax in their local communities. And more recently, as the company's been developing and growing, we're now heading off and we're trying to be recognised as one of the leading independent coffee operators in England. So we've got an awful lot going on and we can't wait to get into talking about some of the things we've been up to. Um, and yeah, kind of ready to roll on if that's all right with you, Ollie. Absolutely. Let's go. All right. So um, first thing I, I, in the title, I, I think to set some context, we talk about the hard way. And, and before we get into those details, what does the hard way mean to you as an operator in the retail hospitality space, Chris? Yeah, look, I think to be clear, and I'm sure that there's many people on the call already that, that recognise that doing anything like this, running a company or running a department or being responsible for anyone, it's it's hard work. You know, there's there's no easy, easy way through these kind of things. And then the if you take a look at a few of the things that are just on there at the moment, the pandemic, inflation, more recently recruitment, these are bumps in the road that you have to navigate as you go through. Um, we don't want to dwell too much on the pandemic because that was a big part of all of our lives, but it had a profound impact on not just our business, but I'm sure everybody's. Um, it's led into quite a serious inflationary challenge and along, uh, well, sort of like underlying all of that, has been a bit of a recruitment issue too. So all of these things put together have not been an, an, uh, a massively pleasant period for any of us uh, but there has also been opportunities and I think that's also important if you think back to the pandemic I had a month off which is just you know never heard of and I would say that a lot of the changes that we've made to our business uh, have probably come from that period of downtime slight reflection and allowed us to continue forward to some of the things that we're going to talk about on this call today so no it's been um, it's hard it's definitely hard work it's never easy but it's worth it when you get it right so 100% yeah, definitely. I'm sure we'll, we'll be uh, hearing about some of those hard learnings as we go through the story as well. And no doubt that people tuning in will feel the same in terms of the the, the kind of emotion and, and what you're sharing. And, you know, in, I think just to give a little short introduction of what we're going to go through in, in these slides, um, you know, th there are many uncertainties in the world and there can be times like recent years where the economic environment is so unforgiving and just in a metaphor, the tide goes out and those who weren't wearing any trunks are caught out. And and the overarching message of, of what Chris and I, I know it's a bit crass, <laughs> but uh, what, what we're going to talk through is it reflects what's on the screen. Basically, surrounding yourself with the right people, which is fundamental to business and, and any business, doing the basics incredibly well, systemizing them where you can. 
uh, ruthless focus on customer experience, which you're, you're absolutely feeling what Chris shares. And if you get those fundamentals right and give yourself that gives yourself every chance to not get caught out and then lead to high performance and, and hopefully profitability in, in all environments. I mean, is there anything else to add on top of that before we get into it, Chris? No, I think I think that's great. And I think that we're going to touch on all of these little bits as we go through, which is uh, going to be really interesting. But yeah, I, I think that great people. I mean, we're a, biz, a people business at the end of the day. I mean, we've I've currently got working with us 220 people right now. So um, there's never been uh, more important that we find great people to work with and just doing the basics really well. And hopefully that's what we kind of talk about in this call today, just getting those foundations and those fundamentals nailed. Yeah, awesome. All right, well, let's get into it. So uh, I'll hand over to you to set up the, the the three lessons. Yeah, I think when you asked me to to do this, I mean, there's that overarching theme of profitability. And, and I think that when I reflect on sort of like this last 10, 12, 13 years that we've been going through, I think if we'd set out purely with the, the with an idea that we were just going to be profitable, I don't think that we'd be here in this format today or here altogether. And I think that when I was thinking about how we might talk through this, uh, there's been transitions that we've gone through as a business um, in this last decade or more, uh, which when you compound them all together, that's that, the net result of that is hopefully that you, that you can take a business to a stage of profitability. But you do need to focus on various things at various stages. So we're going to talk today about this idea of sweating the detail and laying the tram lines and then more recently facts not feelings for us um, and uh, just before we get into the slides and um, you know me and my brother we we are not in any way professionals in business when we set out we had absolutely no idea what we were doing so we've been sort of like navigating our way through this you know for a long time and, and i think that once you've done something enough you start to become a little bit more aware of actually what things are working and what things aren't working um, so if we get into sweat the detail ollie if you don't mind and um, we've just kind of got a little heading under there. Everything matters uh, and it is so important. And in those, we were in Sweat the Detail as a company for probably, and we still do Sweat the Detail, by the way, it doesn't stop all of a sudden just because you get to a certain age or size. But those first several, eight, nine years uh, were genuinely sweating the detail, trying to understand what it is that was working, what it is that customers uh wanted to to come and experience with us how we look after our teams how we process our our way through all of these challenges that we have and um, so if we just move forward one please um, and this side here is just a few polaroids it's not exactly complex but these are some of the oldest pictures that we have of of me and d and the company um and they were taken on an iphone 3g by the looks of it and so that's how that's how long ago it was now now it's a decade 11 12 years ago um, and up on that top left hand corner there's um there's the photo of the first building that we ever opened in and i don't want to get into a story about how it ended up being that building but just shortly that it wasn't supposed to be in that building um, and one of the things that i've experienced as we've gone through the years there is an element of luck that that comes into some of these things and um, and long story short, we were supposed to be in the building next door, which was a fraction of the size. And we originally set out to open a small coffee shop, probably with a few cakes, maybe the odd sandwich. That fell through for various reasons. And if you can imagine when you're doing your first lease and then it falling through and it's an absolute turmoil. Um, but then the landlord called us that we were supposed to be in and said, I own the property next door, which is the one that's on the screen now. Uh, I really enjoyed interacting with you and Steve. I think you could do a really good job of this. Um, well, you talk to me about it. The, the the way that that changed the direction of the business, I can't even express, but we had to then think about the products that we were selling. We now had a, a much larger serving kitchen. We would get into more complex menus, but it has shaped uh, the way that the business progressed over the years significantly. Those pictures of us in workshops are genuinely me and Steve. That is me on a crosscut saw there. My dad's a joiner, for those that might not know that. Um, and we literally built the store by hand and we started off with a very modest budget and we had ten thousand pound between us and then we had a small bank loan from that west uh, and the very bottom uh, picture there is what we looked like 13 years ago um, seemingly a bit slimmer and um, a bit more hair well i've actually got more hair i think but uh yeah it was um that's it that's that's us and we had absolutely no idea what we were doing the first time i drank coffee was the week before i went to meet our coffee supplier um and i'd never drunk coffee before uh, to make sure that I could go into that meeting. I went and had a coffee up in McDonald's, hated it. Um, <laughs> and then I had to go. <laughs> yeah. Um, but yeah, that was the first day we ever served anyone coffee or bacon sandwiches or anything. And we were learning very quickly from that and we were building it from ground up. 
move on unless you got any questions by the way Ollie, let me know no, no, keep going. Going. Yeah. so if we we've now built the store and we're obviously this um, picture on the left hand side is in our first weeks and months and i do actually know who that lady is there she's called jill and she used to come and visit us every single day and i think i was serving her and um, probably a latte on that morning um, and that's what our store looked like. And there's absolutely nothing wrong with it. But one of the things is we talk about this constant sort of like development and this trial and error and sweating the detail. Uh, and you can see in those Polaroids on the right hand side, a little bit like the direction of travel from a store perspective, like that, what customers will be visiting is definitely developed. Uh, we're opening our 18th store tomorrow and uh, it, it still keeps getting better. The shop fits that we do, the locations that we choose, they keep getting better because all of the knowledge that we're gaining keeps compounding so that we uh, make better decisions as we go along. I just want to spend a little bit of time talking about products, which is the kind of three Polaroids that you see down there. You might remember a slide or so ago, I said about how this store that we had in Lynn was different to all the rest and it had a live working kitchen. We used to do, well, we'd still do. We've kept that live, that kitchen still exists. It's the only one that's on site in our business. And we make really great homemade products every single day from locally sourced produce. Um, working at the time, working with really local independent bakeries and suppliers. And we got to love the products that we were selling. And, and the reason why I'm dwelling on this a little bit is because the next slide that we're going to get into in a second is uh, as we were growing, we if I take the bakery as an example, we were buying amazing home, well, corner shop baked tea cakes as, and, and we'd fallen in love with them. Customers love them and something so humble and simple as a tea cake. When we got to a stage where we needed 1500 of them in a morning on a Wednesday to be able to distribute to the business, the baker quite rightly turned around to us with his little kind of bakery and said, guys, I can't supply you anymore. Uh, I can't do this. And he, in all fairness to him, he'd been telling us this for about two years by this stage. And we've been fobbing him off and saying, no, nah, you'll be fine, Carl. Don't worry about it. Keep going. You're doing a great job. Um, but, but there became the stage. And then we were presented with this reality that potentially we might have no choice but to make some changes. Uh, if you move on to the next slide, Ollie, I'll be able to explain it better. Um, we, we were faced with the idea that we might have to buy in a product that we didn't want. And we couldn't live with that. So we had to make a very hard decision to bring production in house. Uh, and what's behind us is uh, all of our production site here. And we roast coffee, which is just behind me over my shoulder. We produce all of our cooked goods, everything that's served in our stores, which is currently 26 lines produced in what we call the cookhouse. Um, incredibly, though, we went one step further than most do. And we actually bake all of the bread for those products, too. Um, Carl did such a good job of serving us incredible products every day and these suppliers of ours have been so kind they've taught us how to bake incredibly um they came in showed us the recipes and how to do it and we now recreate all of these products at 3 a.m in the morning and um, and then we turn them into bacon muffins sausage muffins and then the final piece of the puzzle is we then distribute them to our stores every day and the experience that that provides our our, our stores our, our teams in stores is is unrivaled they literally turn up every morning all their foods there, all their milks there, all their cakes are there, and they're good to go for the day. Because what we want our teams focusing on is the customers and their teammates. That's all we want them to think about. We don't want them kind of bogged down with any of the nitty gritty that we should be worrying about here. I think we're good to move on, Ollie. Unless yeah, I do. Well, just a quick, quick question, if I may. Uh, yeah, I, I think this is quite. This is a really interesting because yeah, you, know, you became your own wholesaler effectively. So I mean, what gave you the foresight to do that? You know, I think that. When you, when you start a company or anything, I don't think the finished product comes out straight away. I think that getting to the stage where we are now is an absolute accumulation of different things that we did for 13 years. And it kind of is a steady progression. So at first, it seemed logical that we would make some tray bakes. Then it, we went, OK, well, we can make some tray bakes. Well, how about we learn how to do some bread? And then we go, well, now we produce all these things from ground up. Maybe we should look at our supply chain and maybe we should start bringing that in-house too. So, uh, yeah, I think it's a kind of slight accident that we've ended up where we are, but it's through that sweating the detail in the early days that partly we were pushed into having no choice but to making some of these difficult decisions. And just to be clear, this creates an incredible amount of complexity for us. We run this property behind us 23 hours a day. We run it seven days a week, virtually 363, 364 days a year. This, is, this isn't easy. And a lot of, I suppose, if this was a um, a much larger maybe gone a little bit more corporate they'd be trying to simplify some of these complexities we have but if you really care about the products that you're selling i think you need to take responsibility for the ones that really matter and 
that that's what we've done here and we're really serious about trying to maintain and protect that quality of products and keep value for the customer um, mm. so that's why we do what we do yeah it's f- fantastic and can I, if i just go back a slide if i may I, I think looking at this so you talk about the product but also the environment every every aspect of the experience and you can see that the you, i think you said nine years for that transition period um of what's on the left to what's on the right but you know did when you initially opened up uh, what you thought customers wanted did that align to what you had prepared and obviously there has been an iterative process to get there but yeah what has that journey been like for you yeah i think that you have to be really open to to listening to your customers watching what they do like when those plates come back and there's things that are left on them you need to ask the question is there genuinely a problem with that product or is it something that maybe it was just someone didn't want it i don't know um, but we make products that we believe in so for me and Steve, uh, we genuinely sell things that we would also be really happy to eat. And if we don't like something, and there's been times where we put things out there, we'll try and we'll go, this is rubbish. We get it off. It's, it's not, we're not proud of this. So, um, and I think that's all you can do. And as it seems to be at the moment, the, the products that me and Steve like eating and drinking and things that, that people seem to like them. So fingers crossed that continues to be the case <laughs> otherwise we'll have a problem and you do need to bring in other ideas and, and things are changing so much I mean people's um, dietary preferences and what they want to consume when they go out keeps shifting and if you take there's that avocado um, item that's on the screen there I mean avocado wasn't even talked about 12 years ago in the same way that it is now it seems that every menu you go to has got mushrooms and avocados on it um, we've got a slide about avocados a little bit later actually but uh, yeah so it's I don't know if that answers your question there, Ollie, but fundamentally you have to be prepared to learn and, you know, it kind of does align, but there's been a lot of changes along the way. Yeah, definitely. I think it totally, that, that makes complete sense. Yeah, let, let's let's move on. Cool. So laying the tram lines, which is kind of the, the second lesson, and, and these are in a particular order, these slides, Ollie, aren't they? They are, we, I've kind of put them in the order that I think we've worked through them as a business so far. And we've said here, systemize everything. And you kind of naturally lay tram lines as you go, but there becomes a stage where you have to get quite serious about it because you're becoming a little bit too complex to kind of wing it day by day. So uh, yeah, systemize everything for us is about those processes and systems, which this building that we are here is 17,000 square foot. And as we talked about a couple of slides ago, we've took responsibility for all of our supply chain. We are our own wholesaler as much as we possibly can be. That's played into when we talked about the pandemic inflation and the recruitment issues. It really helped us in the last 12, 18 months to be able to have direct supply with distributors and manufacturers in the UK or abroad. Um, because we've been avoiding all of those inflationary pressures from the wholesalers, and that hasn't necessarily just directly passed through to us. So that was luck. We 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 didn't know there was inflation coming three years ago, and we went, you know what? Two years out from now, we'll we'll let's protect ourselves from inflation. We'll we'll bring supply chain, and that was just how oh, it felt like the right thing to do at the time, and we could work out how to do it. Then we've got those uh, warehouse. Everything comes into warehouse for us. Then we've got those three production areas: so the roasteries just behind me. Uh, the cookhouse and the bakehouse, which is all the production that goes on from 3 a.m. in the morning. Then there's that unique piece where we also do the logistics to our stores as well. And just to touch on that a little bit further, I worked on the shop floors for nine, ten years, and I still work from now. I can, I can still go and run a store like anybody can. Um, and I thoroughly enjoy it. I sometimes miss it. Uh, but that means that I'm really tuned into things like milk turning up at 11 o'clock in the morning while you're trying to serve your customers is useless. So part of what we wanted to do was we wanted to make it that everyone was just not distracted by anything other than what the customer needed in front of them and and how their team was getting on around them. We don't build stores with offices in them. We don't want people bogged down in paperwork. We want people out of systems, out of books. We want them literally where they they can do the thing that they do best, which is look after the people that are in front of them. Um, And then we obviously do the coffee house. That's what we do. We're a retailer. We're a chain of coffee shops. And we just happen to have this a piece of work that goes on behind the scenes uh, but this is our unique piece this is what we do differently to everybody else or a significant proportion of what everyone else does um but yeah it's uh, good to move on from there well if you don't mind well got another quick question if i may uh so um for in making that change so where you had the rest the the kitchen in Lim, and then and then you've expanded out and you started you went down the central production location route Yes. What what impact did that have with your with stock management and reducing stock days and you know what's wastage been like when moving to this model as a business? Yeah, so 
when you first do something, it's quite blunt the approach you take. You just have to get it working. It's a bit like in that sweat the detail types. You're just trialing, you're just it's just trial and error, you just gotta get on with it, you just gotta try and make it work. A little bit further down the line, then you start to benefit from the efficiencies as you start to learn how it works and what to do. That decision to do this, uh, kind of this process all comes from the fact that the work that we did in uh, in Lim with having those homemade products that were produced on site every single day. We, we wanted to be able to do as much of that as we possibly could in all of our stores. So when you go into a store of ours, it's like that product was genuinely made that day or the day before. It's it's not like it's been there for two weeks or anything like that. It's, we wanted to try and maintain that quality of product, freshness, control over the ingredients. And does that answer at all what you're, what you're kind of getting at? Yeah, yeah, definitely. I, I guess in, in a way, uh, like cost management has been a because uh, I mean uh, there's obviously a, a focus on sales sales and getting uh you know br- bringing revenue into the business but in terms of like being able to control that the cost within the business and then the the amount of stock that you hold and reducing those levels I think is that there's I feel like there's a bit on that which would be great to kind of elaborate a little bit more in terms of when you when you bring it all into the central warehouse and then expedite it out and ha- how you kind of keep those margins tighter. Yeah, so I think that we have a really great customer to to supply from uh, from an external supplier point of view. I mean, we we have every single one of our products. Take milk as a, as an example. All of our milk turns up on site here, and we distribute it for the supplier. And um, so we do benefit obviously from in, improved uh, kind of pricing. So. Uh, we we try and bring all that margin in here, and then we use that that cash that we've been able to save with the suppliers to actually enhance this building, build on the processes, invest in the right people, the right training, and the products going forward. And eventually, that will all compound, and it will drop through to the bottom line. So, this is a long term play. This isn't something that suddenly just pays off two weeks mm-hmm. after putting it in place. It does take a little bit of time to get there, but we can see the benefits already, and it is coming through in the work that we're doing. Yeah, fantastic. So I think there, if we we talk about this building, uh, this is a, an interesting little slide, actually. So that's, on the left-hand side, there's a phone there, which is mocked up with an example of how we used to move stock around the business. And this is the first time that we uh, were introduced to you guys at Zoopra and got to know you and start building our relationship with Kate and that. We used to have little sheets of paper that people would have milk, skim milk, whole milk, beans, whatever written on there, they would fill them out and they would take a photograph and they would put it in a WhatsApp group every single day. And that's how we used to move stock around the company. And you know what it worked? Four stores, five stores, no problems. Suddenly things start getting more complex. We started losing orders. We started missing messages. So you've got no choice but to start thinking about, well, what do we need to invest in today to solve our problems today? But it's also very important that you start thinking about who are you going to partner with for the long term so if we take the relationship that we have with you guys we believe that the solution that we have with you is going to take us for a very long time on the journey that we intend on going with the building that we have here um but this is important to try and make our team's lives as as, a, as easy as possible and uh, the old way of doing things like in the old whatsapp text message and taking photographs of things that would have become really horrible for someone to manage going forward so naturally you need to get into new ways of working um, and, it, and it's the data behind the scenes as well, which we're going to talk about that in a few slides time. But we're really starting to um, see the benefits of having access to various data streams that we can get stuck into and start learning about how our business works. Yeah, awesome. And then the final stage of this, so we've we've sweated the detail. We've really started to understand what our customers enjoy, what they want. We've now gone through the process of laying down those tram lines. And the final piece of the puzzle is to start helping our teams to understand exactly what the expectations are, which is the, the slide on the left hand side. This is an example of what we call the trading academy, where we teach people what it is that we want to do, how we want them to do it, and also the training materials that go with it to keep our teams safe, compliant, um, and doing the jobs to the best of their abilities. And um, so investing in people, we started off in one of the earlier slides talking about how our teams are absolutely integral to what we do. And it's very important that along the way now we continue to invest in those teams uh, and drive the business forward. Just out of interest, so you you, you mentioned uh, 220 people now. And pre- previously we've spoken about 75 people being like the sort of tipping point where the size of the business is growing and and um, the, the kind of number of people. And it, almost like the original culture of the business you you have the you kind of you you create that culture because you're there every day in person at a site level being able to 
to operate and then suddenly it goes past the tipping point what's that how have you evolved the culture in, in this process yeah so i think that it's very true when you're a one two three stores it's like uh, you, you can have a really good influence over the teams that you have and you can really empower them and infuse them um, virtually day by day and then you start to hit the stage and the number that i first felt it was just about as we were entering the pandemic at 75 80 members of, of our team that was the first real transition that I felt. And um, that that was like, whoa, hang on a minute. We've we've got quite a lot of people that we're responsible for, quite a lot of people that we need to communicate with. And it's very difficult. And I think that that's where things like what we're showing you on screen here become absolutely paramount so that you can document the ways of working so that you can effectively train people in a very consistent way on what they need to do. And then you can disseminate this information down into the various team members at various different levels of the business so that they also can confidently say, look, guys, this is how we do it. This is why we do it. This is what we're going to do. And this is the results that we get when we do do it. And um, we also felt that at about 150, that was a strange transition that felt like a shift again. And I think we're about to approach another different feeling. It's starting to feel bigger again. And uh, as we're approaching another maybe 250, which we should be at in the early part of next year. So, yeah, it's a it's a bit of a transition moving through all of these different kind of numbers of headcounts. Uh, mm -hmm. And also what you need to do and how you need to communicate just constantly changes. One of the things that I think all your teams talk about is like communication. Um, and we try everything to communicate. We've got instant chats. We've got web blasts that go out to our teams. We've got like a, an intranet where we put posts up on there. And it, and it is very difficult to concisely and consistently communicate with your teams, but you should, you have to keep trying. It's, it's, it's really difficult to do, but you've got to stick with it. It's very important. Yeah, for sure. It's great insight. Um, so. Facts, not feelings, you know, and if I talk about like the transition, this is a transition that we're kind of feeling we're going into now. Uh, and I think that this is the one that really starts to impact your ability to be profitable because the early stages are all about like we've come up with the product, we've decided how we're going to do it, we've got an idea of what our customers want and what they're what they're dying and crying out for. Now we've gone right. Let's let's try and make it so we can copy this process over and over again. How do we open a store and replicate it and get kind of similar results? The next couple of slides that we're going to talk about, you know, you can't scale on gut. It says there and. I'll let you move forward. Actually, one more slide. This one's this one's a little bit interesting. So if I if I take that one and Steph, I, I've got to thank as well. By the way, I know Steph's helped us up in our office to to put this together, um, and and uh, Joe on your side's helped us get on the call today. So it's you know look, it, there's a nice illustration of me and Steve, which is very kind. We we don't quite look like that, but the we were responsible for everything, and it says for 2011. But to be honest with you, it was like 2011 through to 2021 2022 we we were in the detail on absolutely everything here we were people we were marketing with we finance operations compliance and anyone that started a business will recognize this well and truly there's there's you have to become little professionals or certainly very competent in nearly all areas to become successful and when i look back i don't know how on earth we did get through 10 years to a stage of nearly 200 people without someone to help us with finance, without having formed a bit of a marketing team, without having people to help us with people and the compliance. And whilst doing all of this, we were literally being baristas and chefs every single day. So for nine, 10 years, we were on the shop floors, working with the teams next to us and serving the customers. And then afterwards, we're going home at night and we were literally uploading the invoices, paying the bills and, all the other kind of crazy things that come with it and a lot of people don't realize that that you know really early founders are everything if they go i'm not i'm not doing this today literally it, it kind of grinds to a halt so if we talk about where we're heading and there's a bit of an illustration here of a bit of a boardroom table potentially and we are starting to look like this so over this last year or so we've started to put in people that can be responsible for individual areas and there's a few different reasons why you want to do this one we need people that are better than in these areas they, we've done great to get to where we have and we're really pleased with the progress we've made but we're not professionals in in these direct disciplines so bringing people in to really help you and focus on those things is in, integral but over the years we've built uh, a gut feeling and intuition as such about the way that things work and people talk to us about some of the challenges in the business and you kind of instinctively know right to solve that problem we need to do x and you should know it's very unfair to think that after 10 years that you can expect new team members to suddenly have that kind of intuition or gut feeling. It just doesn't work like that. 
So then this starts to lead us on to, well, well, how do we take all the things that we have learned over the years and how do we start to process all of this information into a format that our teams can also benefit from so that they can start making really great informed decisions that are based on some of the history that we've had and some of the lessons that we've learned, but at the same time with some of the freedom for them to be able to also exercise some of their own autonomy to make the business better. Scaling a business at this size off gut feeling is mega dangerous. And I'm glad that we recognize that we should no longer do that because we're not in front of the customers every single day anymore. We don't know all of the problems that are occurring on the front line. The world is changing all the time. We have to get to a stage where we can rely on some of the data that's coming through, combined with some of the people that are now operating those spaces to make better decisions. I think we can move on to the next slide, unless there's something you want to say there, Ollie. No, I mean, well, the, the process, actually, just one thing is that the process of release, you know, as an entrepreneur, and releasing that control what's that been like for you personally oh i mean and i mean this totally it's really hard it's it's kind of you think about having a, a, you, there's many people on this call that will have children just imagine just imagine to a certain extent just giving your children to to kind of people that you, you you've got to build trust with naturally and you've got to learn about it's really difficult and you know and your teams will naturally make mistakes you know as we still make mistakes and that's absolutely fine it's how you learn from them. It's how you retain that information. It's how you move forward and make better decisions going forward. But it's not an easy process. And if any of our team are listening, they'll, they, they sit in this room with me quite regularly and they know they know it's hard work for me and today. Um, but it's a necessary part of professionalising and becoming a, a business for the future. And, and I'm proud in the way that we're approaching it. I think we're doing a decent job as a whole. Um, so, yeah. <laughs> It's, it's clearly like it's clearly a very entrepreneurial environment and looking at you know a, a, as you hand over those responsibilities or you start to you know you, as your baby and you're, you're, you're giving that to new people who are joining and I see you've, you've kind of got roles like head of growth and head of stores and you know how how do you actually shape the roles like are you very purposeful and going th literally this is these are the things that we need to do and is it very flexible in how you operate? Are there kind of blurred lines in a way? Uh, you know, that's sort of very entrepreneurial way. People wear multiple hats. Yeah, I think there was definitely a time where we were in the multiple hat territory maybe a year or two ago. And I think that that mm. can create quite a lot of confusion, particularly for the teams themselves, because they don't know where they need to go with problems or how they get solutions solved and all these different kinds of things. So I think that really cleaning up those reporting lines when you have to, you know, if, which is the stage that we've got to now, making it as easy as possible for them to go, right, this is the person that can help me with this. And this is this is where I get the answers from and the support that I need to do. I think it's really integral. Take them. Um, coming up with the roles in general some of them are quite obvious most businesses have them i mean we've got a head of growth role and the reason that we have that we're opening one store a month approximately at the moment which is reasonably fast you know that's not slow growth and it's partly facilitated by the fact that our processes centrally are getting stronger so we can mm -hmm. do this at pace when we open a new store it has like a tiny impact five percent impact on what we're doing here now day to day the hardest growth i ever had to do was one store to two that's like 100 percent you you're doubling in size overnight so the the further the further down you get and the you might be doing quite a lot more openings in a year but from a percentage point of view the increase is much smaller the impact on the day-to-day -day operations is easier uh, but yeah i think um that head of growth role came out of we needed someone to take responsibility for executing our growth consistently time after time um, mm -hmm. and that's why adam does that work with us and he's doing a fabulous job already yeah that's great Moving to the next one. OK, so talking about we've got all these um, new people that are working with us and we need to get a lot of information out. Now, one of the things we talked about in systems and Katernet's are just one solution that we use, but we also have various products for scheduling staff, doing our payroll and doing our marketing work and accounting, obviously all the different things you can imagine. It's very disjointed and that's kind of the way that these younger businesses grow. We don't have like one big SAP solution that does everything as an example. So we've got a lot of disjointed information in little silos all over the place. So we needed a way of bringing that together. So with this, this product that we use called Domo, which uh, which is a bit like a Microsoft Power BI, if anyone's familiar with that, where we're, we're bringing into one central warehouse all of the information that we have across the business. And my, the, the interrogation that we can already see we can do on that is, is incredible. And this is how going forward, uh, we're going to be able to communicate with our teams where the priorities are, what we think the issues are so they can get out there with with a bit of a magnifying glass and go right we know where we need to go and look it's not quite as big a needle as a haystack as what it could be 
just on this one, actually, I was thinking about it before coming on the call. This is a really daunting stage because if you think we've been running a business with um, limited insight, like we know what our business is doing, we know what our revenues are, we know what we think our net profits are. But when you start getting tools and solutions like this, you start, you know, they say ignorance is bliss to a certain extent. It starts shining a magnifying glass on things that you didn't realize were a problem. So you have this strange increasing period of anxiety as you're pulling information in going, oh my God, that wasn't quite what I expected, right? We've got something we need to solve there. The other thing is, it's very easy to become paralyzed because you've got so much information. And that's really what my role is. I need to make sure that what is communicated with the teams is, look, there's loads of stuff for us to have a go at here, but these are the biggest ticket, ticket items. Please focus on X, Y, and Z, and we'll review them in another three months time, six months time, 12 months time. So, um, you know, not letting your teams get overwhelmed with too much information. At the moment, we're having a, we're having a ball looking at all sorts. Um, but yeah, but there's a there's a at the end who's eating all the avocados just to talk through that one very quickly. So this is a live example of something that we found recently. Um, uh, one of our kitchens is all around avocados in, and that is a real graph. I know you can't see the exact detail on it, but you can see the blue bar charts higher in the middle there. And we're not selling more, so obviously we're consuming more. So this is that's an example of that magnifying glass. He's, he's homing in and saying, look, there's more avocados going out the door here. We need to get in and have a look at what the problem is. It might be that maybe our portion control has gone off. Maybe we've got a new chef over there who's who's being very generous. Or maybe there's some waste that we don't know about. But we haven't got to the bottom of that issue just yet. But it was a great example for the purposes of this slide of, of what we're going through. Another one, ever so slightly, is we just pulled all of our electric meters in into the company. And we can see by the half hour what electricity we're consuming all night. Um, and this is, this is game changing because we know one store already that's using three times the energy when switched off at night time um but yeah there's loads to go at you've got to be careful not to get too distracted but it's absolutely integral for your team so that they can have access to this kind of information yeah it sounds like you're in a world of kind of finding the one percent incremental improvements that will actually amount to significant uh gains in the long term um how, i guess the question is because in this day and age obviously we're seeing more things like ai chat gpt there's there's lots of new ways of how we're interacting with technology how do you and it's sort of becoming more of a focus on the quality of the questions being asked um so i guess you know what is your approach to interrogating your data and how do you inform the questions yeah so i think that there's this is where there's some things that still we're still operating with the things that are in our gut feelings the things that we're used to we're, we're trying to get those questions out to start with things that we focus on every single day it'll start to become more apparent as we manage to deal with those kind of more mundane things the things that are just getting business done day to day where we'll get into okay well like the energy example energy is important right now and i think the external factors will influence the thing the questions that we want to ask so if we know there's a bit of a hump on the road coming up on the horizon if we can recognize that early and go, right, well, let's get some analysis in place so we can track what's going on. I'm quite progressive with technology, and I think that anyone that's that works in this building with me will say that, you know, I'm quite forward thinking with it. And I know that you're particularly, um, you know, on that kind of training floor, Ali, you talk to me about quite a lot of these different things. The world's changing. We have to adapt to it. You know, there's, if, we, if we don't try to think about what the impact is, then we'll get left behind. Um, mm. So game changer for us, though, informed decision making is 100% what you need to get to. Yeah, uh, definitely. And so I'm just conscious of time. So apologies, everyone. We're yeah. going to run five minutes over, uh, but we'll, we'll, we'll keep going. It's, it's five minutes left or so. But um, in terms of and get your questions in as well as we go. Um, but yeah, the timeline and journey. So wh where you are now when we talk about facts, not feelings and, and sort of there's a process to implementing the systems that capture the data. So like like Ktenet, like the payroll system, the, the ones you're talking about, and then getting to a place where you, you're adding in the kind of data, you know, the 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 BI package, the being able to take that data and then start cross cross referencing and you know re interrogating data from different places. Um that actual timeline and journey to getting there, because you know it can't be a it's got to be a gradual process. You can't just, if there's a business that hasn't got any systems in place, as an example, how has that process from the WhatsApps on that timeline to get you there? Um, so I think uh, it takes time, definitely. And I think you should take a little bit of time to try and get it right. 
Um, coming at it for if you had absolutely zero and you were trying to get to this stage, there's a lot that you need to do. And that's the thing about this presentation that we've done today. And you know, the idea of sweat the details, lay like the tram lines, and then get into the facts, not feelings. If you if you obsess too much about the detail too early, you start focusing on things that aren't actually having a positive impact on the customer. First thing is let's be clear, get the customer experience where you need it to be. And that's we have problems that go on in our stores all day every day and we make mistakes all day every day but broadly speaking we know exactly what it is that we're trying to achieve and what we're trying to offer so start there get that right make sure you've got a product make sure you've got an offer make sure you if you do bricks and mortar stores like we do that 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 makes sense then get into the detail go in further down the line with that scalpel and start going i want to drive those efficiencies i want to drive that profitability because if you just focus on profitability you you, you, you won't get the experience correct for your customers and i don't know whether that's wise advice or uh or not but that's the way i feel about it i, I mm. think and um, but it does it does take time to get here i mean definitely I, we're pulling some amazing data from katernet right now as, as you as you know which is already informing some of the some of the decisions that we're making from purchasing right the way through to our kitchens and production levels and even just operational efficiencies just the way we display information to the team is making them physically quicker at doing their jobs removing the barriers removing the pain um, mm. So I would advise people get into that when when the time's right. 100%. That's awesome. Thanks, Chris. So the end, you know, well, the end so far, and just to be clear, um, what we've what we've talked about today is just where my business is up to at the moment. You know, we uh, we don't know what the next stage brings because we've not got to that next transition, but we're hoping that everything we've built so far gets us to a stage where we have a level of predictable success. Now it doesn't say guaranteed success up there because that if it was to put guaranteed, that would drive complacency. We think that we are becoming to a stage where with predictable our actions, when we open a store, we kind of have a good idea about what the location should be. We've got a decent idea about how we might fit it out and we know what products we're going to service there and we know how we're going to get them there. So it's quite predictable. It's we can replicate it over and over again. But we should continue to develop that experience for for the customer. You know, we shouldn't stand still; otherwise, we go backwards. We want to continue working on our teams and, and bringing in as many committed people as we possibly can. And we do want to encourage some fast growth because we want to be able to invest faster. The best way to invest in your business is grow quicker. Um, but you have to have to a certain level you have to have those foundations dealt with you have to have your product sorted you have to have your experience sorted you do need to have made some good progress with laying the tram lines otherwise you'll topple over and um, and we're like i say doing one a month and we, we seem to be coping with it okay at the moment and 12 18 months ago we would have had no chance of doing one a month it'd be impossible it's brilliant thank you for sharing chris so yeah, that's us wrapped up, I think, from that point of view. You know, sweat the detail, lay the tram lines, and facts not feelings. They're the three transitions that we think we've gone through as a business so far. Maybe we'll come back in a year or two and see whether or not there's been a fourth transition that we didn't know about, because that's the beauty of running a company. Uh, but yeah, I mean, thanks very much for having me, Ollie. It's been really No, thank really you, nice. Chris. I think just just take the uh, moment, I mean, the, open up for questions. See there's no questions. I've got one in terms of that that journey like it is a constant learning journey and and this is my last question because I, I you, you've mentioned to me in the past like store two was the biggest learnings where i think you said store two then you end up closing it and then taking those learnings forward what's that process what advice would you give people on the call to to take learn from the failure and and carry those lessons forwards i don't kid yourself you know, fundamentally, if something's not working and you genuinely can see there's nothing you that you're doing day to day that's causing that failure, like recognize it, accept it. You know, egos can can sometimes get in the way of these things, can't they? And, you know, take the store that we had and the, our second store was in sale and we placed it in the wrong location. Now, thank God we learned that as store number two, because learning that as store 10 and getting it wrong for 10 stores there would have been a disaster, probably bankrupt us. Um, but yeah, so knowing at store two that we picked the wrong location and bless my brother, he stood there on the high street with me the morning we opened and he went, he went, do you think we're a bit far down the high street? And I went, that's a bit late now, Steve. That's <laughs> like, we kind of already built it literally the morning we opened. But he was right. I mean, we we got hooked into the fact that it was a nice building that the landlord was going to fit up for us. So, you know, you have to make decisions, you know, wisely in those early days because everything matters. Everything counts. Get the detail right. Uh, 
but yeah, no, it's been it's been a really interesting journey. We did relocate the store in sale, and just for anyone that's interested, we went and we trebled the turnover. We closed on the 24th of April, and we reopened on the 26th of April. 20 doors up on the high street, and we tripled the turnover. No difference. Same people, same teams, same company, same products, and it just shows how integral for bricks and mortar business that can be. Mm, amazing. Thanks for sharing that, Chris. Where where are those scars and and carrying them forward. What question that's coming from uh, Neil from Essex. Uh, what one thing would Chris do differently if you could do this all over again? Um, do you know what? I, I'm glad that I don't know what I know now because I think that we just wouldn't have the same company. I think there's loads of things that you, in hindsight, you could do better. You know, every interaction that I've had, there's probably plenty of those that I wish I'd, I'd, I'd dealt with people in a different way in cert on certain topics or obviously I wish that we'd not opened our second store in sale and the wrong location but these minor lessons this wisdom that's born of pain as such is what takes you forward and you have to relish that and and just accept that do you know what that's part of the journey and um, doesn't change the fact that sometimes it's painful because it is and um, but these lessons that we've gone through or these kind of transitions, like, I don't think they only apply to a company. I think they can also apply to departments. So anyone that's running a department, you could take the same approach, like sweat the detail, get the department working correctly, lay the tram lines and the foundations, and then get into the detail at the back end. I don't think it's exclusively just about running the company. I think you can apply them to different areas of, of the workplace and your life. Um, but I've really enjoyed having a chat with you about it today. I, I thank you very much for taking well asking me to do it it's very kind of you yeah likewise chris thank you and i, I that was, we'll, we'll close the questions there i think it's a perfect place to close so thank you uh and re recording will go on our youtube channel and and we'll share on socials and directly with those who've attended and otherwise just a really big thank you to chris for being so generous with your time and insight and i hope everyone who's been listening and found it useful and yeah please don't hesitate to reach out if you have any further questions our details are on the screen there and thank you for listening Thanks, Ollie. Cheers, everyone. Bye now. Bizzle. Oh, thank you.